Um, thank you, David and Carl, for putting together this amazing seminar series. It's already been a lot of fun following, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough act to follow the, the ones that spoke before me. Um, so, so let's see if I can keep you entertained for about 45 minutes. Um, thank you also for the introduction. So I'll just dive right in um, and talk about, you know, the, the amazing people who did most of this work. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues and uh, key collaborators, primarily Matt Perrick, who's an extremely talented postdoc, um, also a primate physiologist who's on the job market, incidentally. So, you know, watch out everyone. And Camille Spencer Salmon, a very talented MD PhD student in my lab. Uh, they've done the bulk of the heavy lifting on the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'd also like to thank Tyler Benster and Carl Dizeroth for the generosity in providing the data that I will explain a little bit about today. Um, I have other collaborators also, as you see on this slide. Uh, their work um, is in a methods paper that we're currently writing on the subject that I'll tell you. Um, I'd also like to thank my funding sources for their faith um, in our ideas. All right, so, um, I mean, you know, we, we live in this amazing time when people are recording more and more activity. More is considered better. Just record everything from, you know, every single unit, if possible, from uh, multiple brain regions in awake behaving animals. So we're really in this, you know, the second revolution almost in experimental neuroscience, right? The first one was when we went from recording individual neurons to recording a bunch of neurons. Now we're doing a bunch of neurons in a bunch of brain regions in awake behaving animals, sometimes in multiple animals. And so we're in this amazing, you know, kind of time. Um, and, and what people normally do is, you know, record, let's say from neural pixels or, you know, even wide field imaging activity that I have, you know, symbolized in this cartoon image. And people have, people do, you know, manifold based analyses. Uh, they do dimensionality reduction on these types of data. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my postdoc in his graduate work, Matt Perrick has written a bunch of papers. Many others have also on analyzing these types of um, massive scale neural population activity. And what they find consistently is, you know, neural activity traverses a trajectory in this type of low dimensional space. I'm only explaining this in cartoon form for now. On another trial, the trajectory may deviate a little bit from this one, but suffice it to say that this trajectory occupies some kind of low dimensional subspace or a neural manifold in this, in this space. Um, the axes of which are given by the, the, the vectors of the, of the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix is considered this, you know, uh, succinct mathematical representation of population activity, but what are the inputs that drive this covariance, right? That's a that's kind of a subtle question because these inputs that really shape the covariance of population activity that is a subject of so much um, so much research and interest now could actually be brain-wide interactions, right? So these are interactions amongst different, you know, interacting brain regions, potentially brain-wide. So I've expressed that in terms of this cartoon that you see on the left. I'm hoping everyone can see my cursor. So area A by this, you know, blue blob, area B by the yellow one, area C by this one. And, you know, brain-wide interactions are the things that really shape neural manifolds. And so when people do, you know, experimental measurements or look at these low dimensional representations, there are a few things, um, I'm going to move your, your faces to the other side of my screen. So there are a few things that are inaccessible from measurements alone. And those things are, inputs to each neuron from within and across brain regions, the directionality of these interactions and effects of common input. So what I mean by that is in this cartoon, are A and B, are regions A and B reciprocally connected to each other or is this unidirectional connection with no feedback projections, for example? Do A and B project to area C or does C project back to A and B simultaneously acting as a common input that may correlate the activity of A and B? And how do you scale these methods to multiple regions, right? So most of these common methods, although we are, although you know many groups are currently pushing the envelope on this, can we scale current methods of um, inferring these types of brain-wide interactions to more than two regions? So he, one approach that my lab takes is to build multi-region recurrent neural network models, um, abbreviated RNNs here. And what I do is to build these models that are constrained directly by neural and behavioral data. See, my, my understanding is, well, you know, there are all these data, so why not use them to train these networks in the first place? 
um, and, and then see what you get, right? So I constrain these RNN models directly by neural and behavioral data. And I'm not gonna talk about all of these examples today in this rather you know, flashy uh, diagram, but I want to give you a flavor of the types of data sets that we have access to. So you know, when we build these models, we validate them on ground truth data sets, such as this toy model that you, know, you see in this little gears here about order a thousand units, anywhere between three and you know 20 areas or RNNs that are reciprocally connected to each other. Um, I'm gonna talk about the larval zebrafish data set, which is a small brain that is sampled very, very densely. And so in the experimental data set I'll talk about, it's about half the brain of the entire animal over an extended behavior. And again, the order is about 100 to 1,000 units per area of which NM is a number of modules, three and 13 areas. Um, and then and we have, you know, comparable numbers in mice, in macaques, and in humans. So now if I were thinking like, you know, one of those industry engineering labs, I would want to apply this, you know, brute force thing of saying, as you move from one model system to the other, right, the sampling, there's an enormous partial sampling issue that becomes more and more grave, right? You're actually sampling a minuscule percentage of the actual activity, even if you could look at all of them in, in these larger systems, right? So one could set up a literal analogy where I could have 175 billion parameters and then subsample from it. But what I'm here to tell you is that even with qualitatively similar numbers, right? we're still able to make progress, right? And so once we constrain these networks directly with neural and in some cases neural and behavioral data, we analyze the networks using new methods like such as the one I'm gonna tell you about today, but also using similar ones as those used on the recording, such as these low dimensional manifolds and looking at these subspaces and null spaces in, in um, state space. So I've written a few papers on the subject. Um, and so, you know, if anybody has questions, I'd encourage you to, especially our younger colleagues, um, I would encourage you to write to me afterwards or during or whatever and, and, and talk about them. And so the, the goal of this entire exercise is to infer circuit mechanisms very broadly defined, very overused term, which are not easy to get at from measurements alone. So that's the, one of the methods that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So a, a key interest, and this is a luxury that we have as theorists, right, is to ask a question like this, which may sound wild to experimentalists, right? Which is, are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved when you go from a small nervous system that you're sampling extensively to larger and larger nervous systems where you know not just the complexity of the representations but also the sampling reduces dramatically so are there circuit mechanisms that are conserved and which of them are divergent they're both interesting from you know uh, from from a theorist perspective but under that broad umbrella, I want to narrow this down to one particular problem here, and I'll tell you about it today. So I'm going to tell you about this one technique of how we build these multi-region RNNs. So the basic network design element is something that you know should be familiar to a bunch of people whose names I recognize um, and whose papers I've followed with, uh, with a lot of pleasure over the years. Uh, my PhD work was in these types of rate-based models, so continuous um, analog variables, uh, randomly connected initially. So the initial connectivity is you know, drawn, drawn from a Gaussian IID centered at zero. These are very uh, mathematically elegant models that may or may not have anything to do with the real brain, but you know, we can get into that conversation later. So the way that we design these networks is you can get to know everything you need to know about these models if you knew the firing rate of everyone in the network and if you knew the weight with which they connected to everyone else, right? They follow this, you know, first order differential equation with a certain time constant. And there's a few key elements um, to keep. Uh, and so for those of you who are so familiar with this, you know, you can tune out and then I'll tell you when to tune back in. Um, and, you know, here I have, you know, drawn a few cartoon filtered white noise traces to take the place of inputs. Heim Sompolinsky did some very foundational work on networks like this without inputs um, back in the 80s. Um, I came along um, a few decades later and did this with, uh, with you know, time varying inputs, specifically periodic inputs. Here I've just shown you irregular ones. Uh, the key thing to notice here is a transfer function. We can use any your favorite saturating nonlinearity. Um, we can we also pick 
the connectivity matrix or this entity G, which I would like to slow down for a second because we've kind of renamed this directed interactions, not to be perverse, but because we're training these networks to match time varying data and those data might not be cellular resolution data, right? So when I'm talking about human data, it could be LFPs from, I don't know, 10 different blobs in the brain. So I just want to infer the strength and direction or, or you know, strength and sign by which each element in this model or model unit interacts with everyone else. So I'm calling them directed interactions. The pre's are in the column and the posts are in the, in the rows. So it's the exact same as what you're used to seeing as the J matrix. In the very initial condition, these are drawn from a Gaussian um, balance centered at zero, and the variance is scaled by this factor G squared over N. Haim had shown in this you know, amazing paper, uh, which actually took me almost a year to even you know, re-derive, um, is an you know, interesting little side note um, that, that you know, at, at G of one, networks like this in the absence of inputs become spontaneously active, and the spontaneous activity takes the form of chaos. So you take this basic network architecture and then we destroy it in two ways, right? The first thing we do is to wire more of them together. So this is the thing that I, so what, what I was trying to tell you is to go from a single module to multi-region RNNs. We take a module like this and then we connect it to others. So, you know, back to the same cartoon, there's an RNN A, B, and C that are wired together with inter-area projections like I'm showing you in the cartoon. The directed interaction matrix of the initial configuration is still the same, you know, kind of random as I'm showing you in this cartoon here. Um, the multi-region RNNs, uh, directed interactions, can acquire interesting structures. So for example, if the inter-area projections come out to be sparser or are designed to be sparser, as we know they are in several cortical architectures, extremely sparse, then these sort of off-diagonal submatrices or blocks, um, and again, I'm fervently hoping you can see my cursor, these will be sparser. And then these connections that are shown in these, you know, almost darker blocks along the principal diagonal will be the within region connections, which should be denser. So looking at a matrix like this, lets me look at interactions or direct, or, you know, the sign and the magnitude of the weight by which units in region A or RNN A connect with each other region uh, RNNB and RNNC along this principal diagonal, and then interactions between uh, B and A here and between C and A over there. So that's the first way we destroy exactly what I told you about my entire PhD work. The second way we destroy it is to take um, a network like this and we train every unit to match something that comes directly from data. So here's an example of how that works. Uh, the algorithm is traditionally called recursive least squares. So the activity of a unit, which I'm calling here ZI, I for the unit and of T, as I'm showing you here in this kind of irregular red cartoon trace, is matched against a target that can be derived from calcium data directly. For the human and the monkey examples, we take the actual spiking activity, convolve it with something that turns it you know, continuous like a Gaussian, and we use those as targets and those are symbolized as fi of t. The learning error is the instantaneous difference between those two objects. And that thing drives the update for the entire J matrix, the entire directed interaction matrix at every time step. So the learning algorithm will keep cranking until the learning error goes to zero. The blue trace starts to look like the red trace and you're done, right? Okay, so what does this buy you, right? This is a very supervised, you know, learning algorithm and kindly note, I'm not using this to call it a plasticity mechanism or anything. It's wildly biologically unrealistic, but it kind of gets us to, you know, what kind of structures will match the activity once trained, right? So what does this buy you? This buys us three things. Okay, and also to tell you like in the examples that I'll show you today, I will be using networks that are as big as the size of the data set. However, we've done validations where we've taken a large network and trained only a small subset of the, of the weights and the units. We've also done the exercise where we've taken a small trained network and embedded it in a much larger untrained milieu. Um, okay, so what does this buy us, right? This buys us once trained, the network produces realistic in air quotes, neural dynamics, which I'm symbolizing here in this phi of xi set. And yes, this is a medium-sized whoop, right? Because, well, you know, you're training these networks to do this, so of course they'll do that, right? 
what you can also do is sort of look under the hood uh, in a very, you know, I, I forget that the hosts are European, it's, a, it's an American saying. Yeah. Anyway, you can infer the directed interaction matrix, which I'm symbolizing here by the JM, and you can look at, well, you know, does, you know, you can look at the within, inter, within region interactions and between region interactions in separate submodules. Sub Looking at properties of these matrix is fascinating for us, less fascinating for experimentalists, but you know, there we are. The thing that I'm really starting to get excited about is the dot product of those two objects. And that's the basis of the of the method that we're currently developing and working on a manuscript for. So the currents due to recurrence, if you remember the equation from a couple of slides ago, is a dot product of the activity and this matrix, right? So what am I saying here? So first of all, we call this method current-based decomposition. So once you train this network, right? Region A, B, and C matched against data from let's say three different regions in some experimental prep, you get this matrix in which the, you know, the blue sub matrix tells you that within a region A connections, the B to A connections and the one next to it and the C to A connections next to it, right? And so on and so forth. Now the dot product of those two objects gives you the current due to recurrent interactions in this trained network. Now, if I just sum over this little index J, right? I can look at the experience of, let's say a unit in region A to uh, from other units in region A. I can also look at how, what portion of the currents in region A come from, you know, interactions from region B and how many, how much of the currents seen in region A come from region C. The sum of all three still give you the activity you would have recorded from A. But without this matrix, you couldn't decompose these. And you need the RNN to get the matrix in the first place. So you can't do this with just clever data analysis. So here's this, you know, one more cartoon to really drive home the point, right? So let's say you're recording activity from three regions, right? And we've shown you here one, you know, example. This is, let's say, you know, neural activity in some form, firing rate or calcium activity as a function of time. Region A does the squiggle, region B does this, you know, little wave-like thing, region C does this almost like a fixed point that goes to another one at a certain, um, at, at a certain time step. Once you run this exercise, you can decompose the activity that you observe in region A into its component currents. So the A to A currents are, are made by summing over just the A neurons within this matrix, right? And so you get, you know, the currents from A to A, the currents from B to A, and the currents from C to A separately, right? So it gives you the ability to take the output activity that you've actually recorded and decompose the source currents from the exact same one. You can do the same exercise for region B and region C. So, so this is the valid, so now what I'm gonna tell you about is a validation of this method on idealized you know, ground truth data, which is you know, the top bit of that little circle. So let's say you have three RNNs here, right? This would be the generator model, right? Let's say I make up some data. I take three RNNs connected reciprocally to each other. RNN A, right, the one in blue, that thing is, you know, spontaneously active, it's chaotic, it's not receiving any external inputs. RNN B in yellow is receiving this type of external input, completely artificially designed. Each unit receives one of these, this is units by time, external input, which is sequential driven, given to region B. And RNN C gets a fixed point like input that switches to another fixed point. So RNN B and C are being driven. RNN A is only being driven indirectly through these projections from the other two regions, right? So this is our generator model. And so here is neuronal activity as a function of time or the model's activity as a function of time in region A. We've picked the parameters so that it's you know chaotic doesn't have any sign of receiving anything from these other two. Region B kind of, you, you know, decouple your eyeballs, looks like it's receiving some kind of sequential thing, right? You can see some pattern here. Region C has a fixed point like structure, you know, constant firing rates that go to another constant firing rate at a certain time point. So this is the generator model. So how do we do the curved exercise? We take an RNN, which has three times as many units. So each of these has a thousand units in the simulation. So the model RNN or the one that's trained to fit this object, that has 3000 of them. I'm only showing you, you know, obviously in a little cartoon. And we take this network and we fit each, each one has a target function and we fit this full object 
to all of these activity patterns. And out pops this directed interaction matrix where the pre and the post are in the rows, are in the columns and the rows respectively, weights within A, B, and C along the diagonal and inter area connections in the across diagonal submatrices. The RNN model, you know, the model fits the activity that it is meant to fit. Again, a very small sized whoop because that's what these networks are designed to do. Now we run the curved exercise, right? And we can decompose the activity of region A or, you know, decompose the RNNs fit from region A into its component currents. Now you can see something clever happening. These are all region A units, right? As a function of time. Now the currents from A to A look chaotic and irregular. The currents from B to A now reflect the sequential input that only went to region B. And the currents from C to A reflect this fixed point switching to another fixed point that only RNN, RNNC saw. The sum of all these three give you the activity in RNN A, right? If you were to be recording from region A in the absence of doing any of these things, you would only be looking at activity in region A and not knowing that that activity was composed of these other two components or the sources, right? So then one thing I will show you in the real example is that we can do the exact same exercise of dimensionality reduction and projecting into state space, everything that people do with output activity. So here's region A's activity that I've projected into the dominant principal component vectors and you know, it does what it does. We can also do the exact same exercise making vectors out of or axes out of these currents. So I can take the dominant principal component of each of the component currents that you saw one slide ago, and I can project the activity onto those. And that in the real example that I'm going to show you in a minute, um, well, in five minutes or so, has gives you slightly more insight into what makes up the activity that you thought you were recording than just looking at um, you know projection of the raw activity into state space so just hold on to that thought for a second so you know we are we so you know what do those principal component activities look like as a function of time this is again the component currents currents from a to a here currents from b to a here currents from c to a here and here's the first principal component as a function of time the solid line is, is that first principal component over time. The dashed line is the ground truth, which I've extracted from multiplying the J with the sources, source currents from the, the generator model. And you see that the network does capture those features, right? Like the sequence starts at the right point and ends at some point, right? Like these time points match. When you move, when the fixed point moves from, you know, this time point to this time point, those line up. We've also obviously looked at the R squared of the co correlation coefficient of, you know, looking at the activity of B to A compared to the sequence and the currents from C to A compared to the fixed point. And those are more highly correlated than other than the other component currents. We've also looked at variance, variance captured and like that. And we're working on the methods paper that I will, you know, alert you to once it's posted on bioarchive. Right, so what are, we, what are we building this method up to do, right? So let's say experimentalists show up and give me a grab bag of neurons, right? They just say, here's all the activity we recorded on this particular experiment. What I would like for this method to be able to do is to identify whether a recording is from a single area or multiple areas. We're not quite there yet. Where we are are the other three things. So for example, if there is a difference between a dynamical difference between areas in terms of the G or the kind of inputs they get, or if there's a structural difference between the areas or the types of inputs each area receives, then curved or this current-based decomposition method can pick this up. And so we're still trying to explore what the failure modes of a method like this might be. But you know, really the strength would be if you gave me a grab bag and asked me, if this method can pick up if something is a pseudo population or a, or, or, or a single simultaneously recorded population. We're not quite there yet in terms of its sensitivity. I wanna show you this in action, right? Um, and David, how much time do I have? Hey, that's fine. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. So now yeah. I wanna you know, show you this yeah, half, half an hour or so. Oh, beautiful. So really, 
that it's, can be right. Okay. Yeah, anyway, well right. then we'll be done. I'm, I'm, it's mathematics. It's okay. okay. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So now I want to show you this in action, right? To see, well, what is this actually good for in in the face of real data with all of its, you know, idiosyncrasies that biology throws at you? And so I want to show you this working in a highly sampled system, uh, larval zebrafish. Okay. So you know, all the data for the example I'm going to show you was given um, to us very generously by the Dizeroth lab. These initial experiments were done by Aaron Andelman. Uh, they have since been taken over by a graduate student, Tyler Benster. They're both, you know, incredibly amazing um, and, and generous. And so here's the experiment that Aaron designed, right? So he takes larval zebrafish and then he shocks them for a while. So these are mild shocks that are given to this animal. And that's what you see in the simplified cartoon of a very complicated experiment that I'm showing you. So, you know, controlled zebrafish just sit there and they wiggle their tails periodically, right? And then the shocks start to come on in what's called the behavioral challenge period. So these shocks are delivered to the fish in, you know, some kind of, you know, time varying fashion. They're not strictly periodic, although that appears not to make a huge difference. And when the shocks first come on, the fish waggle their tails vigorously, right? Because they're trying to escape the shock. It's an aversive thing to do to the fish. And so they, you know, whip their tails vigorously to evade it. And that's called active coping. And let's say, okay, the fish are head fixed because they also have to do, you know, imaging on them, which means that no matter how hard the fish wiggle, they can't escape and the shocks keep coming anyway. And that's the thought I want you to keep in your head as we talk about something kind of subtle. The stress has to be persistent and inescapable. And so eventually what happens during the challenge period is that fish go into the screw it, I'm not, sh I'm not swimming away anymore phase. And that's called passive coping. They don't struggle anymore. The shocks keep coming, but the movement of the fish has ceased. And that's what, I, that's what we're plotting here. So this is the tail velocity of multiple fish, five in this case, uh, plotted as a function of time in the experiment. The light pink box that you see here is the duration of the of the challenge period or the shocking period. In black are control fish averaged over the population. And in blue are the shocked fish. And here you see two things, right? Initially when the shocks come on, the velocity of the tail whips has gone up as you see the blue is above the black. And then eventually, you know, the shocks keep coming, the fish can't run away. In the face of persistent inescapable stress, they transition into a different behavioral state known as passive coping in which now you see the blue is below the, below the black. They don't totally quite seize, but I'll show you a time varying example um, in a bit. Now, because the Dizeroth lab does amazing neurotechnological things, in addition, and you should see the time scale of this operation, right? So while this entire thing is happening, they're also imaging from these fish. And so that's what this looks like. So this is a fish in which they've expressed uh, G-CAMP. And you can see you know, different neurons light up at different time points. They have recorded about 40 to 50,000 units out of cells out of a possible 100,000 in the zebrafish. So it's a very highly sampled system. Uh, and have quite a rich data set because the tail is being monitored at the same time as the neural activity. Right, and so this is what this is what the activity kind of looks like. Now, this system is interesting. It's a little biological aside, is because this kind of lapse into passive coping is reminiscent of another behavioral phenotype called learned helplessness, which is like a marker of depression. And I'm using all of these words. Um, I think it's polite to say incorrectly. These are all very subtle, um, very complex you know, full physiology, neuropsychiatric issues. But this phenotype of not struggling anymore in the face of persistent inescapable duress or passive coping is seen in mice and has been studied extensively. In mice, people do this too. Extremely depressed people occasionally will curl up physically, um, fetally in the, in, the, in, the, in the face of persistent inescapable stress, this kind of movement shutdown. Um, and I've learned this since working at Sinai with, uh, with people like Helen Mayberg. And so a lot of work has gone into this research, especially in mice where learned helplessness is also seen. And I would like to draw your attention to these two um, nodes. So the fish nervous system has some homologies in that there is a habenula in both fish and mice, and there's a raphe in fish and mice. And so those are the two or three nodes that I, I would like to you know, explore further. 
Okay, so this is you know the, the brain wide activity and the and, and behavior is being tracked. So now here's the model, right? The actual mo when I say model, not like our kind of model, not theoretical model. I'm saying like you know the what is known to underlie this behavior is that the habenular activity is meant to say, okay, bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening every time a shock comes in. Habenula is known to be connected to the raphe, it's upstream of the raphe nucleus. And it, its projections to the RAFE eventually trigger the RAFE into dumping a bunch of serotonin into the system and saying, I hope you feel better. The cavalry is here. Let's say the cavalry didn't help, which is what happens in inescapable stress conditions. Something else has to shut down the movement. So, you know, this is what I mean when I say, well, we're looking for a mechanism, right? So what I want to do is to build a multi-region RNN model of this entire, entire system. So we have 13 regions, but I want to show you, you know, a subset of this to tell you that even, you know, you can make progress even with a, with a limited, a limited data set. So here I'm going to show you because we can really tease apart everything um, in this model, three region RNN model. There's an area A, which is habenula like area B, which I'm picking a large blob in the brain, the telencephalon. And because I was hoping that the telencephalon would be the thing that's most correlated with the shutting down of the movement, right? The cavalry didn't help, serotonin dump didn't help. I can't go into shock, so I have to shut down the movement. That's why I picked the one that has the most units in it in the data set, and that turned out to be the telencephalon. And then the raphe, because habenula and raphe are the key players that are known from the, from the mammalian work. For, for this phenotype, right? Um, and this is where they are in the, in, you know, I've, I've put little blue thingies on, on, the, on the fish image. Right, so we take this network and every unit has a target function that is derived from a corresponding unit in the actual fish. And sure enough, this, this works. Again, this is a medium-sized whoop, although it is pretty cool. So I'm showing you one delta F over F of each of these regions, right? So I'm showing you in black the data and in blue the actual networks fit. And this is in the habenula as a function of time. And you can see, you know, it matches really well. It misses the very temporally sparse ones, but it gets the overall essence right. The, the raphe-like RNN unit, which is in red, also does very well. The telencephalon one also does pretty well. Now, just to convince you that I didn't hand pick the three neurons in this entire set that works, um, I also do the usual thing, which is to take the activity, you know, dump it all into the principal component space. And you can see again that, you know, the network captures the overall population dynamics that are present in the data. We look to see, well, how much of the variance is captured by different principal components, right? So we do that exercise. Look for how much variance is explained, uh, you know, like when do you get to 90% variance explained? And you'll see that the network, which is in red, gets, you know, a lot of them, right? It's not just getting the dominant two or three, it's getting a lot of them compared to, let's say, 30 that are available for the, for the real network to do. Right. So, so let's go to the thing that's really exciting, right? So what happens if we run this curved exercise? Just as a little refresher, because I'm excited about it, you, got, you are all my captive audience today. So the network gave us this matrix, right? So it gave us the ability to look at the weights, the strength and the sign of the weights within the habenula in the blue block, within the telencephalon in the yellow block, within the raphe in the red block. And then telencephalon to habenula in the block next to the habenula one, the raphe to habenula one in this block, right? And we also got activations from the model that are similar to the data. So as I had told you before, the currents due to the recurrent interactions is the dot product of, of these two objects. And now this is what this is what the currents actually look like. Sorry, there's also an animal that's like, you know. Um, and so here I'm showing you 2200 habenula neurons, the currents plotted as a function of time. Now, I'm only sorting this to give you something to look at. The actual sorting doesn't mean anything here. Um, and the habenula to habenula currents in the first block, the same ordering is used for the raphe to habenula in the second block and the telencephalon to habenula currents in the third block. So once again, the sorting is, you know, it's because I can't stop sorting things, sorry. Anyway, so this basically said that the sum of these three gives you the activity that you would have recorded from the habenula that the experimentalists indeed did collect from the habenula. But the matrix let us decompose them into these component currents, right? 
So I can do the exact exercise that I would have done to the output, except now I can do that in the current space. So I take the largest principal component from each of these three neuron by time matrices and I've plotted them here. So the habenula to habenula axis in blue, raphe to habenula in red, telencephalon to habenula in yellow. Now I take the activity and I dump it into this space, right? So once I project the activity, which is what you see in the gray traces here, I'm also putting the shock times, the early ones in the warm color, and the and the later uh, shocks in the in the light in the colder colors. Remember what I went in looking for, right? What I wanted was something magical to happen in the habenula, except that's not what happens, right? There's a there's a separation of time scales. Turns out that early activity is actually driven by currents within the raphe to habenula subspace. And it's only later on that habenula to habenula and telencephalon to habenula even start getting in. So this is what I was saying a few slides ago when I said that looking at currents is actually could provide insight into something that you might otherwise miss if you just look at activity alone is this kind of thing. Like for example, the early part of the, of the behavior, for example, active coping is driven by currents from the raphe to habenula. This is even cooler um, in the light of the fact that there aren't really feedback anatomical connections from the raphe to the habenula. That's not a connection. What is however true is that the raphe dumps serotonin everywhere. So this could be some kind of in, you know, effective connectivity like you know functional interaction as opposed to a, a direct one anyway this timing effect is cool and so what we're trying to say is that you know as an alternative to the traditional point of view which is to you know correlate this type of activity you know that you see in the behavior the active coping phase and the passive coping phase looking at currents um, and and the low dimensional you know, projection of activity into the current space might be more informative than looking at it traditionally. Like for example, we could take the activity in the habenula, the actual recordings and sort them. We could take the um, average population activity of all the units in the habenula as a function of time. So this is average delta F over F in black again is control fish and in blue is, um, is the shocked fish. And yeah, maybe now in the light of what I know about this kind of time scale separation, I can maybe hallucinate that there are these two things going on. But all I see is a ramp, right? I mean, all I see is this thing averaged and making a ramp. So I think this is still more informative than looking at it that way. And it's certainly more informative than looking at the activity uh, projected into the dominant principal components of just the habenular activity, where I don't see such a clear separation. Now, to really tell you what is going on, I need to, okay, well, before I get to that one, let me show you what, what these things look like as a function of time. This is a control fish. I'm picking a random control fish out of the five that we have. These are fish that have not seen a shark. They're nonetheless head fixed. They're sitting there. So they wiggle their tails every once in a while. The tail breaks a light beam, and we collect a vector of zeros and ones. Now I've taken that vector, I'm convolved it with a Gaussian to give you something to look at. But you know, so the black trace is the act is like the tail waggle. So, you know, control fish waggle their tail every once in a while. So there it is, a tail waggle, less tail waggle, more tail waggle, more tail waggle, whatever. It's continuous. The three currents here, the raffi to habenula in red, habenula habenula in blue, and telencephalon to habenula in yellow, they seem to kind of mirror each other throughout the, the duration, right? They're not doing anything spectacularly different. When you look at a shocked fish, on the other hand, and now I've taken, it's the exact same thing except for a random shocked fish, right? Again, there's movement that's very high in the beginning when the shocks come on, and then it ceases at some point in the middle corresponding to passive coping, fish will also occasionally make an exploratory tail waggle, right? Now I'm convolving everybody with the same Gaussian, so that's why you see one here. And also I didn't want to cherry pick like a perfectly passively coped shocked fish to show you just to convince you. So what you see here, contrary to our expectation, is that the initial part is driven by a ramp in the raphe to habenular current. And it's only later, during passive coping, that the telencephalon to habenula and the habenula to habenula currents start to ramp up. And this effect is true even when we look at averages over five individuals. So these are, so the error bars here are averages over RNNs that have been trained to match five different uh, fish each. 
And once again, activity is also similarly plotted here. Control fish on top. The three currents don't seem to do anything different during the different epochs of the task. In the shocked fish, the active coping seems to be, or the early part is more correlated with ramps in the raffi to habenula current. And it's only later on, probably related to passive coping, the habenula to habenula and telencephalon to habenula current start to go up, as you see in the blue and the yellow, respectively. Now to really convince you of this, I also have to show you that this initial ramp in the current is not just coming from the changes in the connectivity matrix, right? Because it's early. I would like for the early things to be more current driven or activity driven and later things or slower things to be driven more by brain wide connectivity changes that maybe somebody can test you, you know, for plasticity mechanisms. So what I'm showing you here is the changes in the directed interactions or this matrix. I'm only showing you the log, um, you know, the log probability density as a function of interaction strength for this Raffae to Habenula submatrix. So it's only this block, because that's the block I'm kind of interested in in this case. And so what I'm, and everybody is normalized. So that's why, just to show you that the key difference is, is, in, the, is in the tails of these distributions. Now gray, and these are colored by early versus later in the experiment. So the red histogram relative to the black histogram refers to the early part of the experiment. And the blue histogram shows you the later part of the experiment. So relative to the baseline, right? The red histogram or the early part does not correspond to any changes in the actual you know, interactions, directed interactions or connectivity, if you will. However, later in the experiment, after this active coping phase is over and you're well into passive coping, those changes seem to be driven by more uh, permanent changes to the connectivity matrix as seen in the, in the heavy tails and the increase in the standard deviation of, of the blue distribution relative to the red and the, and the black. So what have I told you so far, right? So in the, in, the, in the first paper, before we came up with this idea of looking at currents, right? We were only looking at connectivity changes and we were looking at these matrices. In the 2019 paper, we concluded that, you know, habenular interaction strengthened with persistent inescapable diversity. And that we are seeing some kind of weirdness in the feedback interactions from the raffi to the habenula. That's how far we'd gone with it. Now we're pushing it further when we're able to disentangle these two time scales, right? We're looking at the currents and looking at the currents tell us that there's differential roles of the raffi and telencephalon projections into the habenula, some of which are driven by fast changes to the current manifold and those drive active coping and some by slower, possibly structural changes. I'm saying all of this with a lot of caution. Um, and so what, that's what I've told you today, that looking at currents through this current-based decomposition method might be a more profitable way of, of uh, decomposing the activity that somebody records and gives you a grab bag of. And so we're working on, on you know, manuscripts of, um, of, for both of these sort of things separately. And so with that, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Once again, big shout out to Matt Parrick, uh, who's done some heroic um, work, both in, in, the, in the primate physiology world as well as here. Uh, Camille spencer Salmon, uh, Carl and Tyler for the generosity with the data and funding sources, and, and, and David and Carl here. Thank you.